Hello, welcome to a special vlog review of Shin Godzilla from director Hideaki Anno. This is the latest Godzilla film and start of a new Godzilla series. Seems fitting, the Godzilla franchise has been known somewhat through the eras of Emperor that have been in Japan. The Showa Emperor, the Emperor immediately after Hirohito, being known as a... Starting out as a very serious take before being more and more sort of comedic and family-friendly as the series went on. The Heisei period, which came after that, being more serious and dramatic. Well, there's a kind of midway reboot with God's, with um, the Millennium series, but still it maintained the general take of the serious, dramatic take on Godzilla. And we have the new, with a new emperor, we have a new era of Godzilla, and it's even more serious than that. It's not grimdark by any means, but it's a very more grounded take on Godzilla than we've perhaps ever seen before in the Godzilla franchise. This is again, directed by Hideaki Anno. This is... I did some looking up on this, and this is basically kind of his second feature live-action film. He's done numerous works of Japanese animation prior to this. Um, direct video works like Gunbuster, television series like Kari Kano and Neon Genesis Evangelion, and, of course, the Evangelion animated films. Now, Anno himself is a fan of tokusatsu. If you're familiar with his filmography, with his history, you know he's been a fan of Ultraman. He's been a fan of Kamen Rider in the past. If you've ever read his, the manga Insufficient Direction by Moiko Anno, the spouse of Hideaki Anno, he's he, he, all about tokusatsu. If you've seen Blue Blazes uh, or Aoi Hono, as go by my Japanese title, you know, again, Ano is into Tokusatsu and has been into Tokusatsu for a very long time since a very young, since a very young age. He is one of his first student films he did in art college was a sort of fan film for Ultraman. So. With all of this said, what is what do you describe as Anno's take on Ultraman, well, on Godzilla, on the big G? And to a certain degree, I'd say it is very Anno esque. This is, sounds recursive and it sounds tautological, but it's true. The film very much is dramatic and serious but also not afraid to get into sort of needling bits of societal commentary. In Evangelion, he was kind of, as much as embraced the tropes and conceits of super robot anime and, for that matter, super robot tokusatsu and anti and kaiju tokusatsu, stuff like Ultraman, stuff like the Super Sentai series, the series also was not afraid to poke the needle otaku a little bit with the with sort of with the more for lack of a term introspective not introspective but um withdrawn elements of otaku society with a series that encouraged where the much of the plot of the series when it comes to Shinji Ikari's well-being is related to getting out of your shell and getting into more social contact and that sort of thing um when it comes to societal commentary in Shin Godzilla, it is more Japanese society as a whole and Japanese political. It's it's definitely a film, as much as the original Godzilla film was a film that cannot be observed or watched or contemplated outside of the context of the um, nuclear weapon of the bombings, the nuclear bombings of, Hirosh of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, which were in the immediate memory of everyone in Japan after that film, after those when that film came out. And for that matter, the deaths of the crew of a Japanese fishing trawler after they got too close to American nuclear weapons tests in the South Pacific. This film is a film which really cannot be contemplated in the wake of, um, without outside of the context of the Fukushima Daiichi disaster. As much as the Gareth Edwards Godzilla film cannot... It is a film which references the footage we've seen of the 
of the tsunamis in South Pacific and in Japan with the wake of Fukushima Daiichi and the nuclear disaster in Chernobyl. This film also pays a lot of reference there as well, perhaps even more so, but it feels more heartfelt to a certain degree because it's coming from a person in the same country which has been imminently affected, and not just by the disaster itself, but by the response to the disaster, both foreign response and how the Japanese government has responded to the disaster. And if you pay attention to Japanese news media or Japanese political coverage, if you even passively, you know that there were complaints and beefs about how the Japanese government handled, has handled Fukushima Daiichi and has handled the flow of information about Fukushima Daiichi. How basically foreign media in many ways has been scooping, has been getting more of the truth to a certain degree and the Japanese presses and, and people with Japanese press who are also getting similar information have been somewhat getting cracked down on various other issues. So what exactly is the premise of Godzilla, of Shin Godzilla? In short, it is Shin Godzilla is it, it's Godzilla comes ashore, Rex Havoc comes ashore a couple more times and is eventually defeated. That's the elevator pitch in a nutshell description. If you've seen any Godzilla movie before, you know this part. What makes the movie work with the teeth of the film is how the film basically gets its fingers and claws into the into the sort of Japanese governmental bureaucracy and how it can lead to hurting people not through active malevolence, but through just sheer inertia and slowness to act and its obstacles to communication. And once it gets a clause in, it doesn't let go. So how this works in the film is we spend, a, is the film spends a lot of time on dialogue scenes. Now, if you've, if you've seen Godzilla films before, the Japanese Godzilla films, it's nothing to be surprised about. You have so much budget for monster monster stuff, you have to have something in between. Maybe it's humanoid aliens who are manipulating kai the other kaiju, like usually King Ghidra or Rodan, to wreck the Earth. And the Big G and sometimes Mothra have to, and sometimes other monsters have to come forth and do battle to save humanity. That's usually one of the things. Or it's spies, or it's something else, or it's time travel going back in time to try and turn Godzilla into a weapon to use in American forces to somehow win the war for fascist Japan because the bad guys of the story are actually evil Japanese businessmen, evil Japanese fascist businessmen. Various factors. Um, some more pulpy than the other. Here, the non- dialogue, the, the non-big monster fight scenes are basically what are we going to do about this monster? There is this big monster rampaging through Tokyo we've never seen anything like this before. What do we do? How do we respond? How do we react? And with this all the context for all this being oh, and we're, we're the Japanese government. We have constitutional restrictions on when we can send out the JSDF and for what reason. So how do we deal with the con Japanese constitution in this context? Or how in our bureaucratic power structure do we organize getting people out of the way of this monster in a quick and timely fashion? And the what, where the satire comes in and where it gets its claws in is the answer to these questions are we don't know, so we're going to have meetings to find out what. And we're going to have meetings about meetings to find out what. In the meantime, we're intercutting with the monster rampaging and killing people. And it's pretty clear we need to act. And while they're, while he's clearly not advocating for, and this is a, an anno film penned entirely by him, at least according to the credits. So we don't, I don't know if there's a Japanese Writers Guild equivalent of if other people come and work on the story and assist on the story if they get in the credits or not. But as far as what we see in the credits, this is very much Anno's vision. Um, we have 
in clear in the story that while not only not just unilateral just knee jerk action is not is not required either is not the ideal option either there when we get to meetings about meetings about a response or one more or one more level deeper in this bureaucratic inception then ultimately what purpose is the bureaucracy actually doing to help people but again he's not going for a quote unquote conservative shrink government down the size you can try not to in a bathtub kind of thing he's going you know, hey there's a place for government and when it works and when people are able to get together and work together to solve a problem then we can get things done and the and be sort of highlights as the people to do this and the things to solve this is the, the focus on the younger generation the main protagonist characters of the series are of this film are generally people in their in their mid to late 30s not like your usual average high school japanese teenager or dawson cast teenager it's people in their mid to late 30s who have gotten into civil service in an attempt to help people and now in a position where they where a lot of people need help and they're in the right place to do it and they end up either jumping to the forefront or being thrust into the forefront based on their knowledge their expertise there's a bit in the film where our protagonist has put together his team of researchers and general people who help solve this problem and basically they're all the bureaucratic misfits they're the ones who just won't get along who just won't just get along who will think speak their minds and will try to be direct to get things done and can't necessarily do it and refuse to just work in the bureaucratic confines of the japanese governmental system and want to kind of jump outside that and untie the, the, the knot or loosen the cat's cradle a little bit so there's that and it works really well in the film the film Godzilla films and depictions of foreign countries are often eh, in terms of depictions of foreign governments and how it handles them and their place in the story. Sometimes you get something like Godzilla 1985, the Japanese version, not the U.S. version. The U.S. version changes this, where U.S. and Russian forces, or Soviet at the time forces, are helpful or want to help but are bumbling or otherwise ineffective and sometimes cause more problems than they should on the one side on the other side there is several of the, many of the showa films where we have foreign people who are very much malevolent in the case of for example mothra which is not directly a godzilla film you have the antagonist of the film who is from a from a semi Middle Eastern country slash semi America, it varies depending on which version of the dub and that sort of thing. And it's clear there that it's the Americans just are just there to be in the way or to make things worse and cause the problems. Here, it's kind of a place in between. We have a American liaison with the team who was helpful, who tries to get things done, and actually contributes. On the other hand, there are U.S. characters off-screen who are very much in the way, who very much cause a problem, and are doing things that could potentially make things worse. For example, pushing the solution, also partially backed by off-camera representatives of China and Russia, to nuke Godzilla. People we see on camera are leaning in the opposite direction, and don't want to nuke and want to assist the Japanese government in every way that they can. They don't necessarily have the political pull to get things done, the things they want done. So they'll they'll stall and they'll stall the proceedings of the nuclear machine as much as they can. They'll do what they can do to help, but they are limited. So there's that. And as and as for the older generations, they are. They very much represent the bureaucratic mentality and the bureaucratic mindset 
we have a, we have sequences where it comes to whether or not we're going to shoot at Godzilla. And the sequence is person in the field radios to headquarters, radios back to base. Person in uh, saying we are at the shot, request permission to fire. Person at um, base then contact picks is on the phone to a cabinet meeting with the prime minister, where there's a general there saying request permission to fire. The general then speaks to the defense minister who is sitting immediately next to him, saying we we have the shot, request permission to fire. Defense minister then turns up the table to the prime minister and then repeats the question one more time. And by contrast, for like the, the American television depiction of this, it would be person in the field, pick contacts. If, if you have to get permission to fire in the circumstances, person in the field contacts the base. Base is on the phone with chairman of the joist, line, direct line with chairman of the Joint Chiefs or what have you. Chairman of the Joint Chiefs or chief of whatever branch of the military it is, Navy, Army, whatever, Air Force, then turns to the president in the situation room and says, do we have permission to fire? And the president said, yes, there's still some steps in the middle, but it's feels less streamlined. Here it feels like Anno is, by showing the bureaucratic process more or less straight, he is letting he is letting Japanese bureaucracy parody itself, and by have in particular by showing with this process, oh, while they're doing this, the monsters continuing to pulverize buildings, and kill people, while the bureaucratic cogs slowly process their way through through to their conclusion of yes, you may shoot now. Which is an interesting bit of the pro interesting thing there, and I. It's a level of satire. I, I'm taking it as satire, which you don't normally see, or if not satire, then at least social commentary that you normally don't see in Japanese pop culture. It comes up. It certainly does come up. Um, heck, Ghost in the Shell Standalone Complex Season One has basically one whole episode which is ripped straight from the headlines when it comes to how the Japanese government reacted to the kidnapping of Japanese nationals by North Korea. There is a bit which is just that for um, Go to the Shell Standalone Complex. But this level of societal commentary does not necessarily come up as much, particularly in what is effectively a mass media take on Japanese pop culture. Like, anime is to a degree niche. Even in Japan, it is niche. Some shows get more coverage than others, get more white mainstream popularity than others, but it's stuff like Pokemon, it's stuff like One Piece, it's stuff like the latest adaptation of a Shonen Jump manga. So these are things that if they're going to get into societal commentary, it's going to be doing it in a way that goes over the head. It's either not necessarily aimed for younger audiences or what have you. The stuff that does is usually late night anime, pay-per-view anime, anime on, par on particular premium cable channels and that most people aren't necessarily watching. It may be stuff that's adapted from a light novel or a manga, which is published in a magazine, but again, niche. Here, this is a Godzilla film. It's a Japanese tenfold, tenth pole film, big budget blockbuster with massive amounts of marketing. It is meant to be on the level of the Avengers or any of the other big mainstream American blockbuster films that come out in the U.S. or and also get distributed to Japan. This is meant to be a competition on the same tier with that. And it's doing social commentary in the process, which you don't see as and you don't see as much with Japanese cinema, particularly with films that make it to the U.S., but it's here, and it's clear that it's there. Other than the rest of the film, um, much as with Anno's ticks from Neon Jets Evangelion, we do lots of on-screen text to highlight points. We have, when it comes to this, I mentioned earlier, discussion of, okay, 
legally can we deploy the JSDF to take out the mon take out the monster that's rampaging through Tokyo? As it's going through this, we have on-screen text of the relevant portions of the Japanese constitution that they're talking about. It's not translated in the version I saw because it's a massive wall of text and you can't just subtitle that. And this release is fresh enough from a Japanese release. That we don't necessarily have the time to digital, digitally post-process the text. I think to a certain degree in part, I believe this is because Funimation, I believe, is part of the licensing deal, does the screening in a fashion that meets the rules for the Academy Award nomination period to make it eligible for the Academy Awards. I think that what they're shooting for, maybe. So, but there's that. And we have on-screen captions identifying people and identifying their job titles, which is significant because as the film goes on, people's jobs change. They end up getting more responsibilities dumped on them and their jobs title starts getting longer and longer, in some cases to a somewhat absurd degree. Significant characters in the chain of command die and people move up to take their place and the captions reflect that and the new responsibilities are placed upon them and perhaps whether or not these people are quite ready for the responsibilities of which have been placed upon their shoulders. As an example for this, the Japanese government does not have anything quite like, I think it's the not, I think it's the twelfth amendment of the Constitution, which is the formalized um, structuring of the succession of the succession of command in terms of, okay, if the president dies, vice president takes over, the vice president dies, um, then the um, Senate president I believe takes over, and the whole chain of command there, which ultimately capitalizes Anton to and then there's this guy whose job it is to stay at the White House or otherwise miss the State of the Union address to just in case somebody tries to do a capitatory strike upon the United States government. They don't quite have anything quite like that in Japan that I'm aware of. So there's that. As far as and so that bit is very well handled, the soundtrack is done by... The guy who also did the score for Neon Genesis Evangelion. And much of the soundtrack is cribbing cues and motifs from earlier Godzilla films. I'm not complaining with this. This is, in many ways, an anniversary year for the Big G. So, cribbing these cues makes sense. And there's one particular cue that they use, which use a bunch of, um, which is one which this comp I stuck in my mind because it's a piece that this composer has um, in turn borrowed for Neon Genesis Evangelion for the track, which I believe is called Angel Attack. Let's see if I can find the name of it. I'm on the computer doing internet search while I'm recording this. I believe the angel attack piece or the um, Evangelion attack. It's one of those two. It's a piece that's used either when the angel when an angel is attacking or when the Evangelions or the JSDF are mustered to counterattack against an angel. And that piece is normally used in Godzilla films and here in the in Shin Godzilla as the theme for the counter response against the against Godzilla, whether through a direct military attack, as we see in one of the built scenes, film's major set pieces, and if not, th and then later as they put together the final attack, which succeeds at taking on Godzilla, I'm not going to spoil how they do that. The film itself, beautifully shot. The effects for the kaiju are, for Godzilla, are very well done. Godzilla actually has a couple different forms in this film. Each film, each Design is different and is very much practical effects with some elements of CG used as well. And there's a nice mix of practical effects and digital effects in the destruction. The digital effects are a little iffier in some scenes, but particularly when it comes to digital vehicles getting moved close to the camera. But otherwise, it looks really good. I, this is a film which really merited from seeing on the big screen. And... 
And I kind of wish this was getting a longer theatrical run, because I know that this video is going to hit after Shin Godzilla is out of theaters. And this is a film which I think more people should see. Hopefully, this film... Actually, not hopefully. This film is going to get a Blu-ray and DVD release from Funimation in the U.S. I'm certain of that. Hopefully, that release will be soon. Probably not, because they don't... Because Japan and the U.S. share a Blu-ray region code. So, we'll probably get a Blu-ray release a little... Around the time, time maybe a little after it get the Jap Japan gets a Blu-ray release. Hopefully, we get some really great special features on here. Whether it's an audio commentary, subtitled, likely, or whether it's a whole bunch of making out featurettes, I really am interested in seeing how this movie is made and just watching this movie again. I do strongly recommend when it gets a home video release, uh, picking it up. If perchance it is at, it gets an extended theatrical run or a theatrical re-release at some point before the Blu-ray release. Go see it then. It is absolutely worth your time. Thank you very much for watching. See you next week. Once again, thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, Please like and subscribe to this channel. Subscribe and get you notified when future episodes come out. And liking lets me know that you enjoyed the episode. The video on the right will be of the previous episode of Nintendo Power Retrospectives, if you want to go see what I reviewed previously that on that show. And the video on the left will take you to the previous episode of Breaking It All Down, while well, you'll get to see what I covered there. And below that will be a link to my Patreon page if you wish to back the show. Backing the show can get you mentioned in the credits, and also, depending on your level of support, you can determine what I do future Let's Plays of on Breaking It All Down and what else I review on that show as well. So go ahead and click on that and back the show. Also, backing the show helps me get the show out more often and improve the production quality of the show, which is good for everybody. Once again, thank you very much for watching and see you next time.